GNUS stock. This is Genius Brands, and they have had probably the craziest bubble of anything uh, over this kind of stock market crash timeline. And you can see kind of since they've opened, they've been in a sort of a long-term bear market with some reverse splits. And so I want to take a look at their balance sheet and at their, you know, their press releases uh, just to talk about what they're coming out with and how the fundamentals look on this company and then get into some technicals and look at the general stock market. But I think the main point of this video is talking about warrants, talking about share dilution. Um, which is a huge thing that they're doing right now and uh, and how that kind of affects the stocks and the current shareholders. Uh, so, yeah, so Genius Brands is coming out with their cartoon channel. It's cartoon with a K. And they're saying this is like uh, Netflix for kids. It's a huge, you know, content provider with all these kids cartoons. And it's it's coming out on on cable, on Amazon Prime, on Apple TV, on a bunch of online platforms. Let me just go over to the press release and let's look at that. Um, yeah, so they're launching the Cartoon Channel and this is the crazy hype right now. <clears throat> and this is what all of this crazy stock buildup has been towards is releasing this thing. And it's coming out on all these platforms. Yeah, like I was saying, Amazon Prime, Fire, Apple TV, um, whatever, Tubi, Zoom, all this stuff. Uh, YouTube. And this is a free ad supported platform with a bunch of cartoons for kids. And they have a whole new uh, group of executives that are, you know, supposed to be really good that everyone's excited about. And yeah, thousands of episodes of family content that's all free, like Netflix for kids. And Oh yeah, and here's some good stuff on their execs. So they, I mean, their execs, you know, built Fox Kids Network, sold to Walt Disney. Um, they worked with Cartoon Network, and um, you know, they're they're uh, big name executives uh, that people are excited about. Yeah, and here's just kind of the content, positive, purposeful content. So there's no violence, no stereotypes, no bad language, no. Uh, damage to the environment, uh, no excess commercialization. I don't know what that means. That's an ad supported network. Okay, and then here's just some of the the things that they've come out with in the past. Uh, well, they're coming out with superhero kindergarten now with Arnold Schwarzenegger, which is pretty cool. They had Rainbow Rangers uh, on Nick Jr. Um, and they've had toys come out through Mattel and go into Walmart from this show. Rainbow Rangers has a, a sparkle rainbow unicorn character and a bunch of <laughs> like cartoon kids that um uh, that all have rainbow clothes on um and then llama llama had jen gardner uh, on netflix and they have a warren buffett series uh the warren buffett secret millionaire club baby genius um uh, so it's, it's all positive programming for um you know, nonviolent and supposed to, you know, make your kids smarter and be good, good programming for kids. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a really good looking uh, news release and a good looking uh, <laughs> product proposal. But we just saw the chart and it's been in a, a monster bear market since the beginning. Um, but right now it has been doing really interesting things. And I wanted to point out the balance sheet. And specifically, well, first off, cash, you know, less than 3 million cash. And then you come down to the current liabilities and it's almost 20, you know. So the kind of cash on hand. Oh, and they're, this year their uh, revenue is down over 70%. Um, so they're just burning cash right now. They have a low cash pile and high liabilities. But I wanted to point out warrant derivative liability here because there, this is not just normal liabilities. Uh, warrants are an interesting thing that I want to explain right now and how that works. And um, basically, warrants are similar to options. So you have the option to exercise a warrant and get shares of stock. 
but an option is um, you know issued by a, a bank or something it's separate from the company warrants are issued from the company and it's a way to issue new shares so for those of you that don't know companies can basically print new shares um, and everyone holding existing shares when the company creates new shares owns less of the company it's like money printing they can print new shares and what a warrant is is it's a really i guess sneaky way to print new shares and they issue new shares the company gets cash and then all the existing shareholders own less of the company uh, and this does not always result in the stock going down um, but basically the existing share shareholders take a hit because uh, even if the stock keeps going up, they own less of the company. Uh, and the way that the warrants work is instead of coming out, well, the SEC regulates how many shares you can issue, first off. And and so, I mean, the company can issue shares and give like options to, you know, to employees. You can pay, you can pay people with stock options and like slowly dilute the shares. Um, but with warrants, when the stock like right now, the stock has been going up in a big bubble. And what the company can do to raise cash while the stock price is, is uh, bubbled up like that is they can come in underneath the bubble price and they can sell a mess of warrants. And so when you sell the warrants, the new shares aren't created yet. So the stocks are not diluted yet. And so the bubble price is way up and they're selling all these warrants and they're raising a bunch of cash to service their debt as they're burning their cash pile. And they're trying to launch this thing. And uh, and then what happens is uh, people can either exercise the warrants. And when you exercise the warrant, you're getting shares of stock. But those shares don't exist yet. Like when you exercise the warrant, it creates new shares of stock and you get new stock. That's like money printing. It's like new shares, new new stock. and I mean, they're issuing, oh, I forget the number, it was 20, 20 million or something. Oh, um, I don't have that up. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of shares. And as the warrants um, get executed, new shares are created and the people holding the existing shares own less of the company. And so, I mean, just simply, like if there was 1 million shares outstanding, like you had, you know, two of those shares. So you had like, two millionth percentage of the company um, if they issue a hundred or another million shares in warrants like as those warrants get executed uh, when there's when there's you know two million shares now you own two of two million it's only one millionth of the company like your percentage of the company gets chopped in half and so a lot of people don't realize that companies can do this kind of print their own shares and collect cash um, and then yeah and then also the company like the shares uh, unless a stock has derivatives there's no the company doesn't have to pay you for holding their stock um, the only way that you make money from a stock is to sell it to somebody else so if you actually look at the stock um, you know the paperwork for the stock the actual cash value of a stock is like less than one penny um, and that's all the company really has a liability to pay the shareholders. Um, the stock is just relative to what other people want to pay for it. Um, yeah, so the, just the just the way that stocks work in general is really, uh, I think, really misunderstood. And uh, this is a big deal now um over the last month or so because we've been in a we've been in a period of stock buybacks for 12 years or something like that and the stock buybacks went down way down in that crash and now really the only companies still doing a notable amount of stock buybacks are in the infotech sector most of the other sectors have cut off stock buybacks or, or they're close to zero um, and now companies are starting to issue new shares and issue a bunch of warrants and so this is a huge thing to watch out for is the warrants because the warrants are are a really sneaky way sort of to issue new shares and do stock dilution. So that's what it's called. It's called stock dilution when 
your percentage of the company decreases because they issue new shares to, to new people and they raise cash. And in general, raising cash isn't necessarily a bad thing. And that doesn't necessarily mean you should want to sell the stock or anything like that. But, um, but when the revenues are going down and the company is in solvency trouble and they're selling a bunch of warrants to raise cash just to burn the cash to pay um, debt, that is a dangerous situation. And that's what these guys are doing right now. And let's take a look at the chart and do some uh, some fundamentals on this guy. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, these splits, usually when companies are doing splits, their price is falling uh, from a range where it looks reasonable down into penny stock range where people don't like the company. <laughs> it doesn't have the same kind of, uh, you know, people just, people have a different opinion of penny stocks than stocks that are trading in the tens or the hundreds or something like that. Like people think penny stocks are really risky, but what a company can do is, I mean, this is a, a one to hundred. So that's a crazy huge one. Uh, one to three. So uh, when a company does a reverse split, they just combine shares. Uh, they don't change people's percentage of ownership, uh, but they just combine shares. So there's a less number of shares out and a higher value per share. Um, it's just kind of like a, an accounting thing. But what it does is it makes the stock price look higher. And then it doesn't look like it's a penny stock. Uh, and then you go back on another bear run and it's down here at 20 cents a share. Um, but this stock, all right, let's take a look at what this thing has done. Yeah, so all this, all this bear stuff, all this bear stuff happened during all of those, you know, things I was talking about over the last period. And this looks like kind of one of those daily little blasts uh, that you get like a one or two day little news blast, but it's not. I mean, this is over a couple of months. This is a whole bubble over a couple of months with just this uh, one company. And let me, uh, let me go to like a 15 minute chart and take a look at the shape of this thing from a technical, technical perspective. So yeah, as far as the warrants go, once the price gets up here in bubble territory, uh, they can sell warrants for whatever price people, you know, want to pay. Like they can sell warrants for three or $4 when the share price is up here at eight and they can sell a ton of them. And then usually the, the stock price will come down a little and the warrant price will come up a little. Um, and there's some stock trading trip tricks like that where you can kind of um, you can you could go long on warrants and short on the stock at the same time and you know kind of close the trades when they get closer together. That's kind of like a trick that you can do with warrants if you're trading companies that are doing share dilution. Um, but in general, the share dilution is a big risk for people that are holding the stock long, especially if you're buying in up here. If you're buying in up here and they're issuing warrants underneath you down here and they're like the shares haven't diluted yet, but as people, as it starts coming down, people start exercising the warrants and it starts creating more and more shares of the stock and diluting everyone's shares and it pulls the stock down. And so that's what's happening right now with this stock. And um, from the technical perspective, you get kind of this uh, descending bubble top and not quite a floor. It's sort of a descending floor. A lot of times you get like a flat floor under this. Uh, this one's descending a little bit. And so usually what happens with this is you get some volatility on this kind of uh, shape and then it'll settle out to lower volatility and you'll actually get kind of a flat floor. So that's, it hasn't happened yet. And I would expect it to kind of do that to kind of, uh, to kind of flatten out and go to lower volatility. And then after that, what happens most of the time is you drop, you drop out of here, like a quick drop and then you hit a flat. And then, um, and then from there things can go kind of normally, they'll usually recover after that. Um, that's kind of the, that's kind of the descending, uh, bubble wedge thing that happens most often is it'll settle down into lower volatility and then it'll drop drop on a floor and then 
that's just kind of a look at the technicals on this one. Um, so, yeah, I guess that was the main idea of this video. I mean, I just, the, the reason I did this video is because I started seeing memes uh, from bear, kind of bear people, like making fun of people that are holding genius brands. And uh, I hadn't really researched what was going on with this company, but um, the company Nikola is another big one that's issuing a mess of warrants underneath the bubble price. And so, yeah, so I mean, I guess uh, when you see companies doing that, issuing a, a bunch of warrants, if it's a bubbled up price and people are issuing, if they're issuing warrants underneath, that's kind of a good time to maybe short the company and long the warrants because people can trade the warrants back and forth before before they're executed. And usually the warrants will trade up to where the stock is, but usually the stock Usually the stock heads down, the, the warrants head up, and they'll kind of come together. And that's just sort of that, that's sort of the trading pattern that we're seeing here on this one. Um, yeah, so uh, not investment advice, but <laughs> be really careful with this thing. And of course, look at the balance sheets. And usually when I look at the balance sheets, I'm like, oh, okay, this company has no money, no cash, and a huge pile of liabilities. And like, just that is, you know, as a, I mean, we're in a recession. Any company that has no cash and a mess of liabilities is, is going to be in a solvency risk. Um, but this company, when you go and actually look at the liabilities, like it was like 80% of their liabilities are warrants. And so warrants, you don't actually have to pay. Like, like when, when the warrant becomes due or whatever, like when you have to pay it, um, they don't have to pay that with money. They don't have to pay that with cash. They issue, they create new shares to pay the warrants off. And that takes percentages away from the existing shareholders and gives it to new shareholders. And um, so it's having the warrants in the liability column is sort of tricky because it's not, it's not like a cash liability that you'd have to look at the cash pile versus, I mean, so, I mean, they're only like, it's probably like two or three million so i think it was like four million or something in actual cash liabilities um so that doesn't look as bad uh, but it was 14 million something in warrants uh, which is absolutely insane and um so that's the story right now more than the solvency risk for this company is just issuing a ton of warrants and so the company may do well after that um so I mean, the the warrants might sell the price down to a point, and then um, if their launch is successful and they raise a bunch of cash and all that, the company could do well after that. But right now we're in warrant bubble territory, uh, and it should, you know, kind of probably settle out and then usually drop and then and then go from there. That's what I'm looking for on the technicals. Let's go take a look at the S&P because we're getting some pre-market. Yeah, there's a couple things getting pre-market. All right. What is it doing? Oh, it fell off a cliff. Oh, wild. Okay, so... Yeah, this is uh, super crazy pre-market activity. So I've been looking at these uh, these trend lines. Let me zoom out to like a daily. We have a couple things trading pre-market that we can look at here. So, I mean, we have this this uh, bull market support line that supported the last two years of highly bubbled action. Um, calling that the Volmageddon line, even though Volmageddon was back here. Uh, Volmageddon was the beginning of 2018. This crash at the end of 2018. This is all where the market kind of switched into higher volatility, and we're getting. We're getting the whole stock market kind of swinging across a, an expanding range here, and we're kicking into higher volatility. Um, and so, since Volmageddon, we've been in higher volatility, and this settled it out, and this blew the volatility up again. Um, and now we've crossed way across again. Uh, so we have this, yeah, we have this crazy range, and volatility. I mean, if this thing dropped all the way across the range, volatility would be even higher than probably where it was here. Um, 
but but yeah this is this is a thing that's continuing to happen uh we're we're widening our swings across this thing and we're just going into higher and higher volatility kind of uh you know period right now which is absolutely nutty um yeah so that's just kind of a, a look at the volatility without looking at the actual volatility but we can do that real quick this hasn't changed pre-market but i mean the the uh this is the vvix which is the vol of all and this basically is an indicator of downside risk in the market whereas the vix itself um jumping way up are we getting trading yeah i guess we're getting action on the vix already because it's up here um but yeah the vix is is jumping and this just means that you can get bigger price swings on day-to-day -day action you can have bigger price movements um, but the vol of vol is basically the an estimate of risk in the market so it's a higher risk regime and bigger daily swings possible right now and as far as the whole market now all the fundamentals and the technicals are bearish as of as of pre-market monday or overnight monday um, now we've broken down below this long-term moving average and we're heading we're heading down towards uh this 2008 financial crisis line so so um I guess just in the general bubble model, I'll cover that real quick. Uh, what you see when you're on the backside of a bubble, and and a bubble is more than one trend line. We have three trend lines like this. 2008 bull market support line runs all the way back to the bottom of the financial crisis. And this is a line, it's 12 year bull market line. And we're above that now. And this Volmageddon line we broke from the top and we came up and uh, back tested it here, came up, back tested it here. And then we got below the 2008 financial li crisis line here. Um, and we made it all the way back up through that line to this line and tested it and dropped. And so you get one or two tests on this kind of a tangent line when you're terminating it. And so I was thinking that we already tested it and terminated it back here and got down you know underneath the financial crisis line back here that's what i was looking at like you know two months ago and then we had this insane move so um we've had one test and a hard rejection obviously wow um off of this thing and so it's possible to get back up here and test it again uh, but the farther we get away from it the less likely that's going to be Especially if we break underneath this one, then we're probably not coming back up here like any ever, anytime soon. And so now this is this is the area to watch to see if we get a bullish bounce and a turnaround off of this. Uh, then we can take another look at this kind of area. Um, but if we break under here, then we're going to be looking for a back test of this thing. And so. Yeah, wow, this is a this is a mean opening, and uh, I guess I would like to point out I I've covered the vol a bunch of times, but um, if you're holding like the everyone talks about TVIX, right? And TVIX is a structured product that has compounding, and you can see well this this hasn't changed for today's action yet, but I mean, relative to the highs, you can see that this insane volatility blast has hardly even got up to this little thing here and nowhere near here on the TVIX. And this is because of compounding. So uh, the volatility in the chart and the daily compounding is just uh, is downward pressure on this stock chart. And SVXY, this is what I look at for long volatility on this kind of a trade. And this is a short vol, a short vol, uh, it's an inverse VIX. And what you get here is, this is the big VIX uh, spike here. And now the compounding and the structure of the thing is helping you. Uh, if you wanna go long vol, you short this guy. And you can see here that the action 
so far has almost made it back to the peak on this one, whereas on the t it was not, not even remotely close. Um, so as far as holding holding a fund like this long-term, because these are really built for day trading, and if you want to hold them long-term, I mean, I only short these kind of things long-term. So, And I'm long volatility right now, which means that I am shorting the short VIX right now. And that way, the daily compounding is actually helping your position. And you can see kind of relative to the peak where it already is. And it's really easy for this thing to get past the peak of that one. And like, whereas the TVIX getting past its previous peak is very unlikely. And this thing passing its peak is highly likely. So uh, that's just kind of a look at the structure of these volatility uh, ETFs. And I guess the DXY and the JPY are moving now. Um, so this is the dollar versus the yen, the Japanese yen. And this one I don't look at that often, but this one is really interesting because the yen ripped prior to the S&P starting to rip down. And um, the DX, the dollar versus the other kind of safety currencies, I guess. So you talk about like the euro and the yen. Um, and the DXY is largely the dollar against the euro. It's a basket, but the euro is the biggest one. Um, and it's been swinging opposite to the market. And so this push was during an up, and now we're getting a down movement here uh, as this one goes up. But the, the, uh, the yen had a earlier move, I guess, than the DXY, which was something that you could take a look at, you know, as sort of maybe a leading indicator of the thing turning over. But really the, really the big thing, the big indicator for what's going on right now is the VIX. And the thing that happened on the VIX is, let me throw uh, the, uh, let me throw the SPY up here, or the SPX. So this is really the big indicator is the VIX started pushing up for whatever it was, five, 10, 10 days or something. The S&P was going up or flattening out and the VIX was pushing up while the S&P was going up. And so that kind of a volatility move when the S&P should be, because generally as the S&P goes up, like you see along this entire period here, the S&P goes up as the VIX goes down. It's decreasing volatility. But right here, you get it pushing up against the S&P. And so that's a that's an indicator of uh, some of volatility kind of reversing. And then we got the huge spike here. And yeah, and the VIX is already crazy out here. So um, so this is all bearish. Everything is bearish now. Even the uh, even the technicals are bearish now. So, so this, um, I guess if we're talking about Elliott waves, let me get in here. I mean, this, this thing is not like a, an ABC kind of corrective wave at this point, uh, because we came too high relative to the, the first wave down here. Um, but this could be a flat. And you saw that huge expanding zone that we had here. And so, a flat movement across that expanding zone could be monstrous. I mean, we have like we have this whole range here, kind of available in the high volatility, expanding volatility range, and so it doesn't have to be a big ABC corrective wave. I mean, just a flat, just a flat pattern on an Elliott wave could be a big move down into some crazy territory down like this. Um, so in terms of Elliott waves, like. A big move down is possible from here. And in the bubble model, we've now uh, tested this again and gotten pretty far away from it. Uh, and we're not we're not gone yet. Like we have to break this one and back test it to get to kind of get away from this line. Right now we're still in between. And so 
I guess uh, it's, this is a really difficult place to make a trade because we don't know if we're going to bounce or not off of this guy. And I guess really from from adding a new new short positions from here, right here is a really a really scary place to try to do that in the middle of a big down move. Like you want to see a break and a back test of this, and then you can add shorts for another move down. Um, if it gets into a really bearish move, or wait and see if it bounces and see what it looks like and see if we can possibly even make it back up to do a double test of the uh of the volmageddon line before we break it and so you don't always get a double test if you look at different bubbles like the depression and the nikkei and the you know the housing bubble it's common to double test lines uh before you break them and usually what you do is you kind of swing and you you do a back test and then you swing and you back test, but you usually don't get below another entire bull market line and back up to one like this. Like that is, this, this is crazy. Like this is the craziest high volatility thing that uh, anyone has ever seen, I think. And um, yeah, so the general look at kind of testing a tangent and then getting down to the next one and testing it um like we've already done crazy stuff across the line and back up to this line so this is this is a different shape than most uh most back sides of a bubble but i do think that we're on the back side of the everything bubble now i think that we are in a bear market as i've been saying the whole time and this thing is this thing is nutty Yeah, so exciting Monday coming up here uh, with another red candle to open. And I guess all eyes right now just on this this kind of flat area where we got all of this action last time. Uh, it's not just a random kind of flat support area with horizontal supports. I don't even I don't even use horizontal lines in my analysis. Like this is a 12 year bull market line off the bottom of the financial crisis, and that's what we're getting near is is a an entire bull market support line of this bubble and i'd like to point out that there's not really another bull market support line for quite a ways the next one is down here at like 12 and that's from 1982 it's 40 something year bull market line that's basically the floor of the entire everything bubble is down here so if this everything bubble actually unwinds all the way down to its floor and that usually takes a few years um, that's where it is it's down here around 12 or I don't know and two years from now that would probably be around like 13 or 14 or something but um, but this is where the floor of the everything bubble actually is and we're still on the very top trend line uh, we, we're not even below the second one yet so that's just kind of a look at the back side of the bubble and a long-term bear market where you can back test this and swing out and back test it and then wind down you know on the back side of a bubble and uh, if you go check out my other videos, like if you look up the Nikkei, uh, that's a really cool one where you can see the bubble or Great Depression video. Uh, if you look at my historical playlist, you can see what it looks like unwinding all these different kind of bubbles. And, um, you know, the fundamentals in this one are are different. You know, then the, the Great Depression is maybe 80 percent of the things similar to the Great Depression in this one. But in the Great Depression, the the US dollar was sort of the you know the the currency and it was backed by gold um but in this case it's like all the other currencies around the world are sort of in the position that the US dollar was in the great depression and sort of the rest of the world that's in a depression now and the US dollar is backing those currencies but you can print the US dollar so it puts the USA in a weird position where the depression and the crash is bad for the rest of the world and bad for the USA, but but the USA can print the dollars. So it's a weird comparison, I guess, between the depression and this this one, 
and how the USA stock market is going to react relative to the other markets. But so far, all of the markets are following the same pattern. The USA stock market is not special. And there's markets that are higher, like um, like the, the DAX, like the German market is still above its uh, its trend line, you know, and a lot of the other markets are lower. Uh, but they're all following this pattern. And this is a pattern of the international monetary system uh, contracting and expanding uh, as we unwind this bubble. And you get a really wild uh, kind of the international system is really strange now because other countries, if they want to inflate, can basically. And even though the U.S. can print dollars, there's no way that the U.S. can inflate more than the other countries if the other countries want to, because 70 percent of the world money supply is dollars. And the U.S. has to inflate against that, whereas a country like Brazil or something just only inflates against their own currency. And so they can inflate basically as much as they want. And there's no way that the U.S. dollar can keep up uh, with any individual country that wants to inflate. So that's um, that's kind of a look at the the currency pairs and the exchanges. If, if you can find a country that wants to inflate like a commodity currency that wants to sell their commodities cheaper and wants to decrease their debt burden, um, you know, like uh, South Africa or. Uh, Brazil or something like that, or Canada, Australia, or Russia. Well, Russia is not a good example. They're like completely de-dollarized. But uh, Canada and Australia are bigger economies that are commodity currencies. And like, if they want to inflate uh, their debt down and they want to decrease their commodity prices to compete, they can. And like, America is not going to be able to stop them from doing that. So that's a look at kind of the FX pairs and the structure of the monetary system. And let me just end this one here. I'll go do another video on some volatility or look at the German market or something like that. Um, this is just a video basically explaining share dilution. And I'll probably start, I'll probably start a playlist for, for solvency risk, I guess. Basically companies that are doing stuff like this, where they're issuing a ton of warrants or issuing a ton of new shares. Um, because the long-term kind of thing where everyone's is, is everyone's doing stock buybacks, basically companies, instead of doing anything really productive over the past 12 years, have been using that money to buy stocks back. And that's held the stock prices up. Uh, but the, now we have a bunch of unproductive companies with the massive amounts of debt. And now, now they're even less productive than they were, and now they're paying their debt with their cash on hand and they're running out of money, and they don't have the cash flow to service the debt. And I mean, how, how much, like, yeah, okay, so the Fed is trying to issue more debt kind of to service the, to service the previous debt like they kind of always do, but the Fed can't really create cash flow for these companies, like they're still gonna be in trouble. And then you get in the situation like, does a company really want to do that? Like, take out a bunch more debt when they can't service the debt anyway. Um, but what they're doing now is issuing new shares to get cash. And that's really dangerous for investors. If you get companies issuing a mess of shares, that's downward pressure on the market. And also the treasury, if you get the treasury issuing a mess of new bonds, that's taking liquidity out of the market to use for, for government spending. And so those are kind of the two dynamics that I think have, well, they started to flip back here. And this run was surprised a lot of people, I think, but, but that's kind of the, not like the fundamentals as in terms of, you know, companies having high price to earnings ratios or something like that. Like companies have had bad fundamentals for a long time. Um, like in the Warren Buffett sense, but I'm just talking about like liquidity, like the actual liquidity available here, like liquidity collapsed here um, as the international monetary system just grinded to a halt. And then the Fed went nutty uh, fighting against that. Um, so you have like extra Fed liquidity during this blast out here, but we've switched from basically switched from buybacks to companies issuing new shares 
And then we've switched from the Fed pumping liquidity out to the Treasury issuing bonds and taking liquidity out of the market. And so that's kind of the liquidity outlook for a move down <clears throat> is that there's less liquidity for those reasons. And uh, yeah, and everybody's saying that it's the millennials that got an extra paycheck that have blown the market up to here. And like, that's ridiculous. And also, I mean, if you go to like the German stock index, it's the same shape and it's even higher than here. Like did all the millennials in America that got an extra thousand dollars go and blow the German stock exchange up higher than than the the S and P? Like, of course not. Um, this is this is liquidity in the international monetary system. The whole thing, every bit of it, has to do with liquidity in the international monetary system, and the uh, the virus and the millennials and stuff is a tiny tiny percentage of what's going on. And um, yeah, so basically, we're seeing if we're still in a liquidity phase now, right now. And if this is another liquidity kind of jam in the international market, it's going to rip. Um, but if we are past the liquidity phase already and the liquidity problems are working, then I don't expect anything like that. Like, I think we'll get under this line and back test it and then swing out and do just a really really boring like year or something uh, underneath this line and so yeah if we switch from if we switch from a liquidity problem to kind of a solvency problem then that's going to just kind of swing out and be a boring and dangerous market with huge downside um, it should be like a slow upside move with a huge downside risk um, which is a terrible market kind of for everybody or uh or if we get another liquidity thing that actually hits now then it will just straight rip but um let's kind of a look at the downside the downside uh liquidity stuff and then man for the bulls here i don't even know how to do a bullish case from here I mean, the bulls want to get up. The bulls want to get up here and use this as support, I suppose, or maybe just try to stay. I don't think that we'll. I don't think that we'll sit on top of this line. I think we're either going to test this one or, or break this one and test this one. Um, I don't know. You guys, if you guys are bullish on this. On this chart right now, you guys tell me, <laughs> tell me what the bullish case is, because I don't even see, I don't even see a single bullish indicator in the technicals or the anywhere. Liquidity is bearish. The, the fundamentals are bearish. The technicals are now bearish. And um, what's Bitcoin doing? So oh, Bitcoin's kind of moving down. Yeah, Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is just kind of in this channel. I think Bitcoin could be boring for a little while, but I mean, we saw this this last liquidity rip that we had here. Bitcoin uh, sold off like crazy, so so there there's a downside risk to Bitcoin if we get a liquidity rip, and I don't know what the percentage chance of that is. Maybe ten percent or something. Um. So I guess just for for things like gold and silver that people think are safe, um, those those things all sell off if there's a liquidity rip. And so there's a little downside risk to any of these safe assets uh, in that case. And so I don't really like in anything. <laughs> I don't like anything right now until we see what the action looks like. Uh, so I'm just holding I'm just holding my shorts. I mean I have a couple shorts. I have like a, you know I have the I have some longer term like one year Russell shorts and I have some financial shorts and I have like long oil tankers as sort of a contrarian play that's separate from this whole thing. Like it's a completely different set of fundamentals and
yeah, I just got to see what happens today with this. And the video is too long. And happy trading. And I'll, uh, I'll get caught up on some more new stuff. But definitely check balance sheets and look at that warrant liability. When you see that warrant liability blow up, that's a red flag. And happy.